Good evening, and welcome to our first Writers in Conversation of the Year. I'm Carol Burns, who, for those who don't know that, head of creative writing for the University of Southampton, and we run this uh, reading series in association with Nuffield Theatre. Um, the chance to bring such wonderful writers such as Helen MacDonald and Philip Hensher and Claire Fuller, mentioning a few from last year, as well as tonight's wonderful guest, Rachel Seffert, um, to the Nuffield for both our students and the surrounding community is, I think, one of the favorite parts of my job. And um, I hope listening to them read and talk about their work brings a new excitement about contemporary writing to all of us. We're pleased to be co-sponsoring tonight's event with the Parks Institute, um, also based at the university, the world's oldest and most wide-ranging center for the study of Jewish and non-Jewish relations. And I thank my colleague James Jordan for his help with that. It's unusual for a novelist to have her first novel shortlisted for the booker, the way Rachel did, but she is a novelist unusual in many ways. Her novels are often political, and crisscross both across Europe and back and forth in time, from contemporary Germany in the dark room, which elicited her book shortlisting, um, from today's Glasgow to most recently in A Boy in Winter, which I have here and is on sale outside, um, a small town in the Ukraine just weeks after the Nazis have taken over. This novel switches among diverse characters, a German who's come to the Ukraine to avoid a war, the war, a Ukrainian farm girl looking for her boyfriend in town, the boyfriend, a Russian army desertee trying to stay below the radar, and two Jewish boys hiding as the Nazis sweep the town for Jews. Rachel has been called a writer of great delicacy and toughness by Ali Smith, which seems to me to encompass some of the contradictory strengths of her writing. It's precise in the way it stays close to history, imaginative, and how it inhabits diverse characters, emotional, and how it lays out how history is people. Her four novels have also won her many accolades, including in 2003, being named one of Britain's best young novelists by Granta. Her book of short st stories, Field Study, winning her an award from Penn International. And her second and third novels, Afterwards and The Walk Home, being long listed for the Orange Bailey's Prize. We are pleased to have her kicking off our Writers in Conversation series this year. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you. Rachel has suggested she's going to read um, the first chapter of her novel, but she's going to stop at each section to talk about how each section came about um, with our audience of creative writing students in mind. So um, go ahead. Thank you. Really, if this chapter is to work, I shouldn't have to do any introductions, since it's the first chapter in my novel. <laughs> um, so I'm not going to say anything other than what it says on page one, which is, or to start with, I'm not going to say anything other than what it says on page one, which is Ukraine, November 1941. He is out and running in the first grey of morning ducked and noiseless, hurrying through the fog drifts with his brother just behind him, feeling the tug of his small fingers twisted in a fistful of his jerkin, crossing the cobbles of the empty town street just as day is breaking. Already they have made it past the railway station, the distillery and the cooper's yard, and then all along the silent length of the market street. Unseen, unheard, at least as yet. When they reach the old church at the corner, the boy stops, pulling his young brother close, pressing both of them to the stone walls and listening a moment. He hears nothing and no one, no sounds of movement. The boy's darting eyes see no lamplight behind the curtains, only shutters drawn across the windows. They've been flitting from street to street and hiding, but the boy sees no place here they can slip inside. The fog hangs damp between the houses, and along the winding street before him, shrouding the low roofs and the lane mouths, the huddle of timbered house fronts. At least there is no one here yet to find them. Soon, he thinks. It will come soon now. Didn't the schoolmaster say so? His brother tugs at his fingers, holding up his arms to be lifted, and the boy pulls him onto his back to carry him, 
still cautious and casting looks about himself, but picking up his pace too. They left the house in darkness, only now the low clouds are paling, and he feels the day and its dangers drawing nearer. He feels his brother shivering too, clutched to his shoulders, the short night's bed warmth long out of him. But it is better they do this, better they make for the old schoolmaster's lodgings. They still have more than half the town to cross, but even so, the boy thinks the old schoolmaster will know who they can turn to or the best place to lie low. Then comes the flare of headlamps, a sudden glare in the fog beyond them, the crunch of tyres of heavy vehicles halting on flagstones. His brother grips him, small fists tight and fearful, and then already the boy is turning. Already he is running, making for the shelter of one of the town's many alleyways, even before he hears the rumbling of all the many vehicles following. I mean, that boy is not named yet, but that boy is the boy of the title, the boy in winter. And um, although it's the first thing that my readers encounter when they read this book, it was amongst the last of the pieces that I wrote. Um, and I thought that this was important to mention here in this, this gathering, because I wanted to point up in this reading the amount that um, writing a novel can be about crafting, but also how much ends up being about serendipity. Um, this, my editor at Virago, is, who's a fantastic um, eagle-eyed brain, um, book brain called Lenny Goodings, and if you look in the back of many writers' uh, books, you'll, say, you'll see a thanks to Lenny, many Virago writers, um, including Sarah Waters, for example. Um, she kept saying to me, is, so the character, the next character you are, you are going to encounter this evening, is he the best one to start the book with? And she said that to me every so often over the course of about a year. And the boy, who's called Yunkle, he only came into the book about six months into the writing, properly. So I had this idea that there should be children in it, because children... Uh, heightened peril but I didn't know who they were yet I didn't know for a long time until the uncle arrived but it was important that there were children in the book because children were amongst the only Ukrainian Jews to survive the Holocaust and I wanted my book to be about the Holocaust but also about the surviving of the Holocaust so it was, it was very important to me that there was a child in the book and that the child should outlast the story of the book. But it took a long time for me to realise, with a lot of Lenny's prompting, <laughs> um, that the best person to start the book would, with would be Yunkel. And then it was a matter of integrating Yunkel with... So introducing him, introducing that peril, it, uh, and introducing the town, because the town is very much part of... It's kind of a character in the book, I guess. So I had to do all of that, and it's a page and a third. So it took a long time to write that first page and a third, but they are instrumental. The next person that you encounter... So you've had Yunkel coming in, you've, you, know, you know that there is... It's dawn, you know that it's winter, you know that there are children hiding. And you guess, probably from the date, that this is not a very good time to be in the Ukraine. And then there are these vehicles that arrive. And then the next, and then we skip to Otto Paul. This German name. Otto Paul wakes to the noise of a door slam. One truck door, then another, below his boarding house window. Loud reports echoing across the town square beyond his half-drawn curtains. He must have left them half-drawn last night, too weary and chilled to notice. Still fogged with sleep, for a short time all Paul can see is the leaded squares above his bedpost, framing the town hall clock and schoolhouse, squat in the autumn mist. This squat and damp place he's been posted. Zeigt euch! Is it German? Pokatschia! Paul thinks he hears Ukrainian shouted. 
but his foremen and workers are all quartered well beyond here, out in open country, and it's too early to be waking, surely. The grey outside is a before-dawn kind, and he's not slept well since he arrived here. Paul has not been able, and he needs to rest. But there is that shouting again. Mach schon! Shrill and coarse. Some fool out there is playing at soldiers. Paul pulls the blankets higher around his shoulders. He will pay them no regard. Who can have any regard for what soldiers do? For armies, he asks his daughter, although she is miles from here. His wife is far away in Munster, but Paul talks to her most mornings, silently, inwardly. He turns his thoughts homewards, seeking comfort, thinking of the sound of her somewhere in the house beyond him, of rising to find her buttoning her coat in the hallway mirror, tucking her curls under the firm hold of her hat brim, and then pulling them out, pulling out just enough of them as the bells sound out the first service, all waiting in the pews with their small daughter while Dorla takes communion before work, walking home again, arm in arm, through the Sunday Altstadt quiet. But now more trucks are arriving, loud below his window, and although Paul has the covers pulled against them, he is awake. Thoughts of home can't block them out, or that shouting either. Ihr sollt euch zeigen! Too loud to ignore, it has Paul confounded. It has him disordered, sitting up, pulling on his shirt. He can't find his glasses. He has to get up to feel for them, on the desk first, at his bedside, and then in his engineering core trousers, hanging on the chair back. And all the while it continues, this bellowing and ordering, this ungodly noise at this ungodly hour of the morning. Paul hears dull thuds falling as he fumbles down the unlit stairwell. Are they hammer blows? Discharges? He can only half make them out through the thick boarding house walls as he reaches the foot of the staircase, searching his tunic pockets, still looking for his glasses. The stoves are all dark and there is no one in the kitchen. Up even before the housemaid, Paul has the out-of-sorts feeling that this day has started far too early. It has started all wrong somehow. Stooping at the window beside the low front entrance, he finds his glasses finally and hooks them over his ears, peering across to the town hall, looking for the clock, sure he has missed its hourly strike. Sure it has missed its hourly strike, or is he the one who's missed it? And then what he sees out there brings him up short. Soldiers, on the town square, field grey uniforms, Wehrmacht in the fog, it's not the first time he's seen Field Grey here, although he's told his daughter the territory is secure now. It has been secured for rebuilding. They are done with their Blitzkrieg. I can promise you this much. Paul is careful with, the words, with his words to her and his weekly letters, of course, because the times being as what they are, heaven knows who might read them. But also in his daily mumbled thoughts and reports, because Paul feels Dorla deserves this care. She would hate so much of what she sees here. The SS convoys, for one thing. Here, in such numbers, they rake through the countryside. There were SS jeeps only the day before yesterday, passing in a dark line along the horizon beyond Paul's roadworks. His foreman pointed them out. Sir, a man of few words, he tilted his chin in the convoy's direction, and then they both raised their heads from Paul's drawings, pausing at their work to squint at the speeding vehicles while the labourers toiled on behind them. The jeeps were too far to hear against the pickaxe blows, pick blows and the prevailing wind, but they were swift, that much was certain, seen against the slow crawl of their building progress. Paul had his fingers gripped to the road plans, the wind tugging at his paper version of the highway they were already behind on. But he stood and watched the convoy instead of returning to the task before him, because close behind the SS jeeps came another unit, order police first, sent from Germany, and then so many Wehrmacht vehicles, such a long line of them, one jeep, one truck after another. They were enough soldiers to have Paul counting, to have Paul mistrustful. Why so many soldiers behind the lines? And now here he is at the window, rooted, caught by the figures gathering on the town square. It is the same mix of grey and black uniforms in front of the schoolhouse. Has the same convoy come to town? Such a crowd of them, it seems there are always more and Paul can't, can't understand all their calling. Some is German, some just unintelligible, and he doesn't like their urgency. All the way they are always moving, always more groups of them forming as though readying for something. Still he has to keep watching because in amongst the shouting come new sounds, not just hammering but cracking too now and splintering. 
and then Paul hears rather than sees the schoolhouse door kicked open. The noise of this jars him. He sees lights inside the school and they are moving, electric torches. Paul follows their progress as they pass the windows. The soldiers, they must be passing along the ground floor first and then up the back stairs. So they're searching the place. More, it sounds as though they were hurling things, school desks and school chairs. A pane is struck upstairs, a window on the upper floor, the glass bursting outwards then scattering across the flagstones. Are they turning the place over? Paul hears shouting, harsh, from inside, and then the soldiers spill out again. Glass shards grinding underfoot, torch beams swinging this way and that, they surge back onto the town square, such a mass of them, while he can only stand and watch, still with this feeling that he is barely keeping up, not understanding nearly enough. And then an old man and an even older woman are bundled out of the doorway and onto the paving. Grey and stooped, his schoolmaster's frock coat torn across the shoulders, the old man puts an arm up, pleading. It is a shielding arm above the older woman's frame, Paul can see this. Her face, pale in the torch beams, is turned upwards in confusion to the booted figures who have come to stand over them. Aufstehen! They are ordered to stand. Mach schon! They are ordered to run. They are herded. They are herded. Paul can find no other word for it. Three soldiers behind them, even more ahead. The two old people are run down the cobbled street. And that is amongst the first of the pieces that I wrote of this novel. And Otto Paul was the person who I started the book with because I had read um, a piece... I'd been writing another book and had not been making headway with it. It was also set in the Third Reich, but it was very, very difficult um, for me to get a handle on. It was uh, going to be based around my godmother's family. My godmother was half Jewish. Her mother was, uh, well, my godmother was quarter Jewish, actually, in the Nazi um, racial categories. Her mother was categorized as half Jewish, and her father was categorized as Aryan. And the whole family survived the war in Hamburg because her father refused to divorce his wife. And I was very interested in this story, I was interested in writing the story of a marriage like that over the period, and bear in mind the, 12, the, the Third Reich lasted for 12 years. And the amount of privations, the amount of restrictions, the amount of laws that came in, it was incremental. Um, but the pressure, although it was incremental, would have been constant all the way through. And I thought that would be um, really interesting to write about. It proved to be really, really difficult to write about. And I was being helped by a historian in, at the University of Hamburg who at one point, she called Beata Meyer, and at one point she said, I just didn't understand the resistor personality. And uh, she gave me a series of essays published in Germany under the title Zivil Courage, which is a, like a post-war term that Germans have coined, which means civilian courage. And um, the point is Germans didn't show enough civilian courage as a mass during the Third Reich. And it was um, a collection of essays about different people, not all of them Germans, but different people un who had resisted the Nazis. And the point of the collection was not to say, look, there were some good Germans, <laughs> but to say, um, what to, to, to examine whether, there, whether these people have anything in common. Is there such a thing as a resistor personality? And one of these... Uh, people who appeared in these essays was an engineer called Willy Aram, and he uh, was a Catholic German who ha he and his wife had both been dismayed by the rise of the Nazis um, they were very educated people, they were Anglophile they were um, they had very strong moral compass because of their faith and they, they thought the, the Nazis were appalling, they were know-nothings um, they were um, ignorant, and um, the war that they started was a crime. And they decided that he could not, they could not countenance him fighting in the war, so he, he used his engineering credentials. He was of an age to be drafted. They used his engineering credentials um, to get him employed by her father's company, and then employed by um, 
the organisation taught, which was the engineering wing of the Wehrmacht, the sort of quasi-militarised um, engineering unit. And he was stationed in the Ukraine, in a small town in the Ukraine, in 1941, at the end of 1941, just after the um, Operation Barbarossa meant that the uh, Germans had um, made it that far through to Russia. And they were their intention was to build five or six main highways from the German Altreich, the main Ge um, you know Germany, through the whole of the German territories into Russia. And these were roads of exploitation, so they were going to bring troops in, but they were also going to bring resources out and back to Germany. Willy Aram thought he could sit out the war in a place like the small town in the Ukraine where he was stationed, but then he woke up one morning in the autumn of 1941 He's woken up to the sounds of the Jews of the town being rounded up. And um, I thought, there you go. That is something you have to write about. Because there is a person who has done everything he thinks he can to avoid being caught up in a crime. He thought the war was a crime. And then an even greater crime is there in front of him. And what do you do? If you're, if you're the kind of thinking human who um, realises what's going on in front of their eyes. What do you do when something even worse is presented to you? And what the real Willy, what Willy Aram did, the real man, was over the course of about a year, he used his transport networks and so on that he had available to him to uh, save five Jews. Um, he managed to get them transported to, he didn't do it personally necessarily, but he managed to get them transported to ghettos where they were misused and used as slave labour, but they, they survived the war. That's very honourable, but that part of it was less interesting to me than the immediacy of what happened in the town over the next three days, because as I read a bit further, I realised what the Nazis did during that winter followed a pattern all the way across that territory. And, um, and I thought this, what I could create there was a, a kind of, in a, in a novel would be a kind of any place Ukraine in uh, 1941. And this German could be an everyman German. And what I have read just now is a sort of edited, crafted, but essentially was my uh, initial response to reading about Villiaram. I just thought that what what would it have been like to wake up on that morning, try writing it. And what emerged, or a person emerged in that writing, which is right at the end when he, uh, of that little section, which was the schoolmaster. And uh, this person, this first victim that Otto Paul sees, and... Uh, I'm sure you've all experienced as you're writing that then a character will just pop out of seemingly nowhere and you'll feel, oh, there you go, that m that's meant to be this person. This person is so strong, he's come from a wormhole to the universe and um, I've got to write about him and so I did. And you'll note that he also appears in Yunkel's piece. So he was, he was the person that Yunkel was on the way to trying to find at dawn because the schoolmaster is the one who will know how, where they should go at this juncture. So he's just been, Paul has just seen him being herded with his mother. They're herded, Paul can find no other word for him. For it, three soldiers behind them, even more ahead, the two old people are run down the cobbled street. Lauf, Dreck, Jude! The schoolmaster hears boots on flagstones ahead and behind him, slammed doors, slammed windows as he is chased through the grey lanes beyond the town hall. I should say, actually, very, very early on, it became clear to me that there wasn't going to be one character in this book and that the narrative was going to have to swap between them. I knew it was going to take place over a very short time period, but those, the events, which, as I said, were repeated all over the Ukraine that winter, um, would be seen from many different angles. And so this sort of passing of the narrative baton is something that happens all the way through the book. 
He hears slammed doors, slammed windows as he is chased through the grey lanes beyond the town hall. Raus, aus den Häusern. Stumbling in the half-light and confusion, he reaches for his mother amid the fog and the calling. Alle Juden, alle Juden draußen. So close to his mother tongue, his mother's Yiddish tones, the old teacher can understand the orders even before they are repeated in Ukrainian. All Jews outside, even as he struggles to keep pace with the SS men who bellow them. All Jews, all of you, now we say. There are a dozen SS around him, hounding him, hounding his mother, and there are still others beyond them. They seem to fill the small town streets and alleyways. So many more than he'd thought. The schoolmaster had not anticipated even nearly so large a force. But now he has run past whole packs of soldiers, of policemen crowded at the corners, standing wide-legged at the house doors and pounding. If he had only known this, that soldiers would come hauling people out of their houses, that police would come looking in such numbers for any who refused to comply with the instruction. Juden, zeigt euch, show yourselves. All Jews are to show themselves. They were to be at the brickworks at six. One suitcase of belongings, winter clothing, food for three days travel. Make ready for your resettlement. But the schoolmaster had decided. He was too long in the tooth to be given such orders and his mother too frail for traveling anywhere. Her old cheeks wrinkled like winter apples old eyes searching his. But we're not allowed, she told him as he ushered her through the schoolhouse doorway yesterday evening. You're now not allowed in here. There are so many things forbidden them since the Germans came, and she is frail now in mind as well as in limb. It was too hard for her to understand why they should lie low there in the disused classrooms. It was all too convoluted and too dispiriting to explain to her. But the schoolmaster had thought they only need lie low for a day or two. So he'd urged his mother gently up the wooden stairway, cracking and groaning under their combined weight, all the while thinking how he'd taught the town officials who issued this German order. Men he'd thought were decent, but who had offered their services to the new authorities, hot foot, so soon after the invasion. Such opportunists, what has happened to their scruples? Two generations, three generations, for three decades almost, he'd taught this town's children, Reading and writing, respect for their elders, wrong from right to, have they retained nothing? These thoughts consumed him last night, and now he could curse himself for thinking them. Holding tight to his mother to keep her from stumbling, the master berates himself for wasting time. All these hours he spent resenting, he should have been thinking on the morning, on what the SS might do when he wasn't at the brickworks as ordered, and when they found the house deserted. Scheiß Juden! because now they are driven past one house front after another, where the soldiers swarm furious. All the front doors flung wide, half the windows also. Leah! The SS shout from the upper windows, disgusted at finding them empty. Scheiß Juden, ich sag's dir! The policemen tear down the curtains. They tip the linen chests out onto the paving, and the schoolmaster is pressed onwards over all the scattered housewares, thinking those people must have been given warning. He was warned too, after all and he knows now that he should have heeded it. One of his former pupils, one of those opportunists, came to the house after the order was, is the order was issued, under co cover of darkness, without his chains of office. Wise to do as they ask, that was his best advice. He stood between the narrow walls of the old master's stairwell, this provincial official who'd been one of his most diligent students, and he whispered, you should comply, or make yourself scarce, you and your mother there. I'm sorry, I'm sorry to tell you this. But the schoolmaster hadn't wanted to hear those apologies, and his pride wouldn't let him run from the Germans. Now the soldiers turn on them. They turn and shout and shove at him, rough with their fists and elbows, pushing hard into his mother to stop the two of them running, and the schoolmaster has to throw his arms out to take hold of her, to stop them hurting her, as they are herded through a doorway. They are run down a dark passageway, too dark to see the way ahead, and he keeps a firm grip of his mother's arm, reaching out with his other palm, pressing it to the wall that they are pushed along, trying to hold himself upright. The floor below is brick and damp and worn away, and he has to press hard to keep both of them from falling. His old teacher, the, the old teacher struggles to keep pace with the soldiers, and all the while he tries to place himself. They've been chased through half the town streets, and he's not been able to follow where the soldiers have taken them but then the soldiers fall abruptly away from them. The noise of their shouting recedes, the passageway widens and clears, and he can slow again, he can look about himself. 
There are high brick walls on either side and high works doorways. They've been brought to the old brick factory. They've been brought here anyway. The order was to be here at six. It can't be much later now, the schoolmaster thinks, as they slow to a halt in the passageway, and he grapples with his thoughts again. He's kept hold of his mother's arm, so thin inside its sleeve, and he feels how she leans into him, bird-boned and fearful. He'd wanted to spare her this. He'd wanted to spare her, but here they are anyway. And surely this is worse, this harrying from the soldiers. The ones who ran them here have fallen behind them, and glancing back, still apprehensive, the schoolmaster sees they are gathering at the entrance to the passageway, bent over, leaning at the door frame, they're catching their breath, and others are joining them out there on the street beyond the doorway. Did they chase down more of the townsfolk? Did more hide like him? The schoolmaster hopes briefly that more are still hiding, and that they hid well enough for the Germans not to find them. Forwards, get moving! The schoolmaster does, he as he, does as he is told, as new shouts come from ahead of them, this time all in Ukrainian. Get a move on! Three policemen stand, coshes raised at the passageway's farthest end, and the old teacher moves his hand swiftly to his mother's shoulders. He sees grey light leaking through the door there. Dawn has come, and he wants this harrying to be over. The door is pushed open, and he sees a room full of faces, full of shoulders and coats and hats and suitcases, but it is mostly the faces the schoolmaster takes in. Pale and cowed, bewildered, they turn to the door and the latest to join them. There are a hundred in there, more. Perhaps it is nearer two or even three. It is a press of people. The schoolmaster sees the small factory floor has been pressed full, not just of townsfolk, it can't be. It must be Jews from all over the district. Who knew we were so many? This throng of faces comes as a surprise to him, a sudden comfort even but then a cosh is pressed between his shoulder blades. The master is shoved into this crowd, his mother after him, so the nearest must jostle and shift to make room for them. Shoulders part, arms and backs, but there are too many in here already. There is no more room to be had, and the shove the old man got was too hard. He staggers forward, losing his footing. Lurching now, he lets go of his mother for fear of her falling also. Oh! And then a hand comes out and grasps him. Schoolmaster! It comes from among the backs and elbows, and the old teacher reaches for his helper. He reaches in gratitude, only for a kosh to fall behind him, a blow to the head that fells him. And that's the end of chapter one. And that abrupt ending also came as a complete surprise to me. I had thought that this was going to be a character that would, I would spend the novel with and who would see the unfolding events of the days, who, whose eyes I could show the part of the next couple of days through. But then my subconscious introduced the kosh onto his head, and I thought, if an elderly man is hit like that and receives no medical attention, the elderly man is likely to die. If not immediately, then certainly pretty soon and um, so I'd removed the character from myself <laughs> as a vehicle and I felt um, not very happy <laughs> about it on many levels um, but then after thinking about it for a while and keeping this chapter as it was and not really quite sure what to do with it, um, I thought, actually, people were lost like that all the time on days like that and over that winter. And so, actually, if I can, if I can uh, make my reader feel even slightly as bereft as I felt, I've made my point. And so I kept him in. Had you written any scenes with him that would have come later if you hadn't? Yes, I had. I'd, I'd written scenes with him and, um, and children. Mm -hmm. who, and I didn't, know who the, you know, I didn't know who those children were yet. And one of them had, you know, then over time became the uncle. Mm -hmm. But I didn't know whether the children, the, you know, the children I would have in my book or the child I would have in my book would be a boy or a girl, for example. I didn't know 
how old, you know, all of those things were still open to question, and I was still doing a lot of research and reading. So I did, you know, making an investment in a character involves writing <laughs> for me. I don't plan, I just write. Um, and then after I've got a, a chunk of scenes, a good set of scenes, then I see how they might fit together. Mm. And I think that's, uh, for me, I th I've arrived at that way of working over a, the course of uh, four novels and uh, having thrown away 200,000 words of a novel, for example, because my, previous way, <laughs> because my previous way of working was not very, um, was working against myself. Mm. So I used to try and write from the beginning and just persevere all the way through, which means that you, uh, because things come to me strongly out of chronological order or out of story order, whether that's chronological or not, um, I'm always sort of it, it, writing like that in a linear way, my way through the book, often feels um, like I'm putting off things. Uh, perpetually putting off things and trying to write the in-between bits, and the in-between bits are, are leaden. And that, but however, if you write whatever you feel like, um, I write in scenes, not everybody does that, but I definitely write in scenes. And if you write the scenes that are coming to you, then you, uh, you have a cluster of those scenes, then writing the in-betweeny bits mm -hmm. um, is less leaden. And they, you, know, you have things with the life and energy. And, um, scenes with life and energy to connect rather than lots of connecting bits and perpetually deferred scenes. I think it's Walter Mosley who said, I try not to write the things that people skip. <laughs> <laughs> and those in-between things can sometimes be, we don't need these. Exactly, yeah. But one of the things I was thinking about as you were reading those sections was just how good you are at building scenes. There is so much tension there and I'm just wondering if you, uh, are any things that you do to, to make those scenes so successful? Uh, rewrite and rewrite and rewrite and rewrite. Yeah. Yeah, I have no other answer other yeah. than that. Yeah. And I suppose allow yourself to surprise yourself by ending a scene differently than you expect it. Yeah. I mean, sometimes it is. Sometimes you have to be very deliberate about it when you're rewriting and you say, right, here's a line that I really like. Um, and at the moment, it's somewhere two thirds of the way through and maybe I could stop the scene there and then just see. And then, you know, the next, leave it. And then the next day or the next week, come back to it again and see, does it work with that line just at the end? Did I need any of that other stuff? And if you do, maybe that other stuff can be heavily curtailed and woven in somewhere else. Um, because it is, uh, it is when you're, if you're crafting a scene that needs to be tense, then it is all about things having life and energy. Mm. And not allowing that to dip where it shouldn't be dipping. Mm -hmm. And you do such a great job of, of writing these um, novels set in a bit of history. Um, I guess they're historical novels, but they don't feel like that to me as I, as I think about them. So how, how do you go about balancing those, those two really important elements of your work, which is one is the history, and the other is the imagination, which you need to bring things alive? Um, well, I think the, the history is the thing that sparks my imagination. So I can't imagine writing science fiction, for example, I can't imagine making a world, you know, because you have to make so much. You don't, I, I, not only do you have to make the characters, but you also have to make the world, and you have to make it consistent, and you have to make it resonant with today's world. And, you know, I think that's, that's beyond me. However, history is the thing that, that sort of drives something in me. Um, and that gives, ri that gives rise to my imagination or my characters. But then you, I also very, uh, quite clear that I need to also allow myself a little bit of space where I am imagining. So I didn't, I chose very deliberately not, to, although I knew the, the name of the town where Vili Aram was stationed was Namirov. And 
I could have set this novel there. But then you're so tied to that geography of that place and um, to the exact events that happened in that place um, that then there is no license and no, um, no room for your characters, your invented characters, to breathe. And um, so there has to be a certain amount that is not, you know, that is just imaginary. And I, I, I um, one of my favourite authors is uh, Joseph Roth, Josef Roth, Joseph Roth, um, who is a, a German novelist and short, uh, short story writer, wrote novellas. He also wrote reportage um, and journalism. He was a German Jew and he... Um, wrote uh, one of his most famous books is called the wandering jews and um was sort of essay collections of essays about um the jews of europe i guess and you know many of these communities that were that don't exist anymore because of the the third reich um but he describes he, there's a really wonderful little passage in one of his essays where he describes a, a town like the one that I described where he says you're coming over the Ukrainian plains and then the first thing you see is little huts and then those huts give way to stone buildings and then there's a you know the town arch and then there are some paved streets and then you get the little huts again and then you're on the plains again so I had that's what, what I had in mind when I was making my my place and I don't name the town ever and I think that's important for the sort of freedom of the mind and the reader's mind. And that was another thing that Lenny, so I gave my, the schoolmaster had a name, you know, when, I, when he popped into my head, um, then one of the first things I did was name him. And, um, but Lenny Goodings, my editor, told me that he shouldn't be named. <laughs> w once it became clear that he was just going to be this fleeting figure, um, that he sh that it, he shouldn't be named, and um, so he had his name withdrawn. And I'm not going to tell you what it is. <laughs> <laughs> You're not allowed to say. I'm not allowed to say. No, it's just for me. <laughs> Interesting. But the novel wasn't ever called a schoolmaster in winter. Now was it? No, wasn't as bad as that. It wasn't. <laughs> it was. It was called all sorts of things um, that I were love really working titles. dark. I know they were really dark and gloomy and awful. A winter reckoning, <laughs> and things like that. Um, but uh, Virago were really insistent that um, there be a person named in the title. And so then I had to choose, um, you know, and then this was before um, it was finished, so, uh, and before I had completely turned it, completely shaped it. And so part of um, the decision to put Yunkel at the beginning and me writing that, the opening that I read to you, um, was who's going to be absolutely central. So there are five characters, and which one of them is the pivotal one? And, and that one was always going to be the one in the title. And then over the course of the book, and of, the of writing the book, and of really becoming clear that um, it had to be about more than the Holocaust or the, um, the process of the Holocaust and resist, try attempts to resist the Holocaust. It had to be about surviving the Holocaust as well. And um, that's how Yankel ended up. It's not a spoiler to tell you this, by the way, if you haven't read it. It's, um, it's how it happens rather than what happens that's important. Mm. Although I must admit I wasn't absolutely certain what would happen at the right end. at the end okay so yeah. they they have survived this bit of the war yeah yes. so it, it takes place over the over primarily over three days and then there's the following spring you encounter them again briefly and that was a very intense way to structure it too those those three days are very precisely delineated mm -hmm. i actually stretched out stretched out over three days because most of the time it happened the um, the SS moved in, they did their work and moved on again, and you know that could take anything up to three days, but usually it was um, much swifter than that. And um, initially, I thought, okay, this is going to be twenty four hours, 
in the life of a Ukrainian town in 1941, but 24 hours is not long enough for characters to um, to develop some kind of for enough of my characters anyway to in the geographical situation that they were in and so on um, to develop enough crossovers. Well, and, th and some of them undergo change. And to do that in 24 hours would be difficult. Very difficult, absolutely. Yeah. 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 It's just not... You, that's the other thing, is if you're working with historical material, you're always working with plausibility, perhaps in a... Um, you know, to a greater extent than if you're, everything is made up by you, because you can make up the parameters as well. Whereas if you're working with, uh, you know, history, and particularly history that your readers are likely to be familiar with, you're always working with and against what they, th what your readers are likely to think is plausible. And so, for 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 my characters to undergo a, a enough change, for there to be a story there, mm -hmm. there had to be uh, it had to be over a longer period than twenty four hours. So one of my favorite characters is Yasia, mm. and and one reason is she does something that I didn't expect her to be the one to do. I'm trying not to be spoiling here. We may, we may end up revealing that after all. But you were going to read us uh, one of her sections as well. Yeah. yeah. So there's the boy, Yunkel, and his little brother trying to hide in the town. There's Otto Paul, the German engineer, um, who is sort of in and out of the town over those three days. Um, and then... When one of the other really instrumental characters is Yasia, who is a uh, young Ukrainian, young Ukrainian woman. She's 17, and she has come to the town to look for her fiance, her boyfriend, who, as Carol said, was a Red Army deserter and is n now working with the German, with the Germans. <coughs> and she encounters the boys. She encounters Yankel and her and his brother. And to cut a long story short, she takes them in. Um, she's staying with her with her cousin in the town, and he has a he has a workshop and a small attic above the workshop where she is sleeping. And she takes the boys in, not realizing why they are hiding. She just takes them to be. The whole town is under curfew, and she just takes them to be town boys who need to be hidden from the Germans. Um, and this takes this little scene that I'm going to read takes place on the first night where she hides them. So she's sort of hidden them for a whole day, and now this is the night. I need to find it. Um, While Rachel's looking, I'll mention that. We want you to ask questions, so think of one. So when I look into the audience, I see five hands all at once. <laughs> so what you know when this is happening is you know that Yunkel's parents are in the brick factory. Yasia doesn't know this, but you as the reader do. Yasia has brought food to them. She feeds them. She sits with them and she watches them playing and she thinks they should be quieter and then she falls asleep. While she's watching them, she sits and she falls asleep and then it is the small one who wakes her, crying out. She hears him. Yasser sits up sharply, eyes open, finding herself half in darkness. Um, Ossip's shirts are still on her lap, that's her cousin. Needles and buttons lost, scattered across the planks. The lamp is no longer at her side. It is over by the boys, under the rafters, where the small one cries again. A child's noise, calling out for comfort, for his mother. And Yasia stumbles to her feet as she hears it. The older boy is quick to stop him shouting. Yasia sees how he presses a hand across his mouth and he pulls him close too to try to soothe him. One rough arm about his shoulders, he rocks and he hushes, rocks and he hushes, and then he starts up his whispering. Yasia is closer now so she can hear him, but she's still confused by the dark and being woken, and the words he speaks sound odd to her. 
The small ones whimpered replies too. Yassia nears them and she tries to make out what they are saying, what caused him to shout out. But it is a strange tongue they speak with one another, murmured and furtive, like a secret they keep between them. No townsfolk speak like that, none that she knows. Yassia feels she has taken in strangers. And then this idea sets off a ticking fear inside her. Are they Jew children? The boys keep up their murmuring. Outside it is so quiet now, Yasya doesn't even hear the wind any longer. She strains her ears for sounds of Ossip waking or of patrols, for sounds of anything at all, while the fear ticks on and on inside her, tightening her throat, sending her thoughts falling one over the next. If there is no one there to hear her, no one to see her, she could put the boys out into the lane, send them off down the alleyways and be rid of them. But then the older one glances up at her. Yasya feels a sudden flare across her cheekbones. He saw her looking. Perhaps he saw what she was thinking. She glares at the boy, half to cover her shame, half to make sure he stays silent, and she puts a finger to her lips in warning, still listening for sounds, for signs that they've been heard. But she cannot put the two of them out. Yasya knows this, and not only because one of them is small and that would be shameful. The whole town is shut down around them, waiting for the soldiers to go again. The neighbours will wake at any noise in the yard. They are bound to look outside and she cannot have anyone hearing or anyone seeing them leaving. What can she do but let the boys stay on until morning? Yasya sees that the older one has already drawn the same conclusion. It is there in his eyes, a surprising defiance. But the small one has calmed the little beside him. He sits blinking at Yasya from the shelter of his brother's arms and then at the rafters all around them in the lamplight, settling back into his surroundings, and so the older one turns away from her. He lies his brother down again, keeping his back to Yasya, as though still defying her to put them out of here. She sees it in the set of his boy's shoulders, stiff and insolent in his stubbornness, smoothing the child's curls off his forehead, murmuring softly as he tucks the straw like a nest around him. And while Yasya watches him blanketing and covering, inexpert and careful, tender as any mother would, it occurs to her, their due mother must have been taken. She must be in the factory, and the older boy knows this. This thought doesn't help her, nor does the feeling that this older one sees right through her. Yasya keeps watch on him while he lies the small one on his side, pushing the lamp a little closer so his brother can see his toys again. They've got these little toys, little toy houses and little toy um, wooden trees <coughs> which they talk to each other about. And he keeps up his murmuring story all the while too, touching the wooden trees gently with his fingertips as he speaks, ordering them on the planks, opening out the grove, neatening some of the others into two short rows. The smaller one is still wakeful, but he is settling now in the straw, soothed by his brother's whispers, and Yasya hopes his eyes will soon be closing. She hopes the older one will stop that whispering too, hush that strange tongue of theirs. She would hush it if she could. Only when the young one's breathing calms enough for sleeping does the older boy quieten. He lets his story tail off then. The lull that follows eases Yasya's fears a little, as does the sight of the small child's sleeping features, but she stays watchful as she picks up the lamp and retreats to the trapdoor. She will put the boys out tomorrow. The older one saw that in her face, Yasya is sure of it, but for now he pays her no regard. He doesn't even lift his head as she reaches the ladder, ready to climb down. He stays where he is, half attending to his almost sleeping brother, half carrying on with his ordering of the wooden shapes before him. His mouth no longer forming words, but his eyes are intent as he crouches over them, his face bright with thought, it seems to Yasya, as though he is still telling his story, only to himself this time. The orchard rows are finished. She sees how he pushes the small farmhouse to the end of them, so a neat avenue of fruit trees leads to the carved wooden doorway. Does he imagine a warm hearth behind it, a warm welcome for himself and his brother under those roof tiles? Where does the Jew child think he will find that? Yasir douses the lamp, a signal to him to lie down, be still and silent. So do you remember how she came into being and when you realized or how you realized how important she would be? Um, I knew that her boyfriend was going to be in it. So her boyfriend is working with the order police. Um, and I knew that 
because what the Germans did in that time was um, they didn't transport, they told the, the Jewish population they were going to be transported away, the Jewish population of every town, but what they did to them was massacre them. And uh, so I knew that would have to happen in the book. Um, but when I was writing The Boyfriend, the girlfriend happened. And, um, and then everybody else in the book was male. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just, uh, or every other principal character in the book thus far had been male. And I had been trying to make girl children in the scenes with the schoolmaster, and, but none of the girl children were really tangible somehow. Um, but then this girlfriend suddenly was. And... Um, and uh, what I thought was, w and what was I was doing in that scene as well was exploring what is, um, what is bravery, what does it really look like in those sorts of times, you know, when really when push comes to shove and uh, bravery, I came to the conclusion, often looks a lot like cowardice <laughs> or feels a lot like cowardice because it's the only... She is, in a way, her hand is forced. The only decision she can make is the, is the right one in the long term. And not, uh, and uh, a lot of the time out of pragmatism. So she can't throw the boys out at that point. She realises they're Jews. She realises that means I am in a whole lot of trouble. Um, and, uh, but she can't get rid of them because if she tries to get rid of them, she is very likely to be seen and to be heard, and therefore it's she just has to wait it out. And um, so that you know that's not what we like to think bravery is, <laughs> but um, it struck me that there must have been lots of moments like that, and also it was about Yankel, and uh, you know he, he it's about him being exploiting those moments and what it takes to survive is not just you know it's survival is not just about the people who do the saving but it's also about the um the people who do the surviving and he just he wouldn't let her put her put him out him and his brother out you know i really felt that in that scene that he would he would scream and shout or threaten to scream and shout because if she was going to do she was going to try and get rid of him, then he would get rid of her at the same time. You know, and that's also not very nice. <laughs> but um, the times were, were as they were. Although it was basic human kindness that made her bring them in to begin with. Yeah. Yeah, it's not all doom and gloom. <laughs> A question from the audience. Yes. Um, I haven't had to delete entirely, but I definitely had to alter. And that's, I mean, I do do quite a lot of reading before I write, you know, because the, the reading gives rise to the writing. Um, but, but then it's really important to check as well, because quite often when we read, you know, I or, or when I read anyway, it might just be me, but um, I read and then, and then I embellish or you make what's convenient, or what you think, oh yeah, that happened. And, and then actually when you go back to the source, you write a scene, and then when you go back to the source, actually it didn't quite happen that way. And, um, but I, I tend to feel, I mean it's annoying, but I also tend to feel it's grist to the mill, because then, then you are forced um, to think, well what is important in this scene, is it just a... Uh, um, <coughs> Is it just entertainment? <laughs> and if it's, if it's just that, then it doesn't matter, does it? The link to history, I can leave it as it is. But if it's not just entertainment, then I have to work a little bit harder to make it fit. 
I was wondering if you've ever thought about writing a narrative form of nonfiction as well, instead of fiction. No. <laughs> Not yet, but there's an idea. Is that because you, you do so much like the imagination, the process of creativity and the imagination and invest in imbibing bare facts with scene and... Yeah, I guess, and I also think it's, um, it's because, I mean, I'm a real, I love reading history. I mean, I do, it's, you know, it's really, I read much more history than I read fiction, actually. Um, but it's, I, I feel like the, the will to write comes when the historical record is not um, complete. So I can't find out what I want to know from the historical record. So, w for example, in the Ukraine, one of the first massacres was one of the largest. It was Babi Yar in September 1941. And, you know, it's 30,000, maybe even 35,000 people were massacred by the Germans just outside Kiev. And this took two days, I think. I remember correctly. So, and these people were walked out of Ukraine or out of Kiev, and to a quarry outside, and were shot individually. And um, you know, obviously there were rows and rows of soldiers during the shooting, but essentially they were shot as individuals. You know, it wasn't. It was mass slaughter, but lots and lots and lots of individual murders over a long period of time. And um, what the historical record didn't tell me was what the people were thinking as they were going out of the town. Um, because they must have heard. There's no way they wouldn't have heard gunfire. Oh, the what, later on, not the very first ones, obviously. Not the very first yeah. ones, no, but, you know, day two. Mm. Or, you know, hours into the massacre, even. And... Um, they must have heard and they must have told themselves something. And that's a really, really interesting human question. But of course, you know, they were killed. And then also the people who were watching. Because there, you know, there are... Um, some of the testimonies that I read describe the people watching and the abuse that was hurled or um, the sadness on the faces or, you know, people wanting to turn away. And what's going on in their minds? But they're not there for me to ask, you know. This is now a time, you know, where, where people who lived through it are no longer there and you can't go along and find them. And, that, you know, it's that, those sorts of questions that, you know, then you think, well, that's the only people who, who can approach that are, are novelists. Looking for questions. Yes. Um, you obviously want to entertain, but presumably you also want to inform, educate, or stimulate the readers to find out more about the things you're writing about. Um, where do you see that balance between... <coughs> Um, I don't think one is, I think one is essential to the other. So if it's not, if it doesn't grip you, then you're, then as a reader, then you're not going to be wanting to find, you know, wanting to look beyond it. So it's essential. Oh, okay, yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, no, I'm one of those terrible po-faced people who, <laughs> <laughs> who, who can't possibly, you know, why, why would I write a book that's just for entertainment? I don't know. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, it's, hor it's very po-faced, I know, but that's just the way I am. <laughs> yes. Um, I th well, I think you, you, do, you always hope that you can do it all first and then just write. Um, but it never works out that way. 
And I also think it's actually very, you know, I, this is my fifth book, and, the, and it's actually quite good just to let yourself write um, as things inspire a scene or a character um, and not be too hung up on is it, um, is it historically accurate? Do I need to know absolutely everything about what they would have, you know, what kind of knives they would have used or what kind of wood the benches would be made out of? You know, all of that kind of stuff, because you can check that. Um, and um, five books in, I think what I realise is rewriting is actually quite pleasurable. Um, and actually uh, comforting rather than, oh God, if I don't research it now, then I'm going to have to rewrite it. It's such a chore. It's actually, if you think about rewriting as being um, a little safety net or a any of that, you know, to give yourself a psychological advantage, then, um, then the research is not so onerous either. You're, you can allow it to be the thing that inspires and the thing that will then provide the really, you know, when you're doing your checking, the thing that will provide the detail that makes it just perfect. So your readers really believe you, you know, because the, the apron was made of hessian rather than jute or whatever, you know. I mean, anyone who knows Annie Prue, you'll know, or Cormac McCarthy, you know, those, all those sort of technical details that they do really well. Um, that where you really feel like oh, if she knows what she's talking about, I'm going to read the the rest of those inches of pages. Um, you know, fully fully believing her. So it it, it it does always intermingle, and it's good when it does. You know, one thing you haven't talked about, Rachel, is your um, your own family background, and and how that's sort of intertwined with this book. And I was wondering if you would talk about that. Yeah. So, I mean, you probably maybe realise, because I was, spoke the German with a German accent, that I am German. My mother is German anyway. And um, I grew up bilingually. My father was Australian, but he was a professor of German. And I grew up in this country, but in a, a very German-identifying household. And probably the most important thing, given I write about the, I've written two books about the Holocaust, is that my grandparents were both in the Nazi party, my mother's parents. My grandfather was a doctor with the Waffen-SS. He was in the SA first, so the brown shirts. And then he was in the war, he was a doctor with the Waffen-SS. His, his profession was to be a GP. And uh, my grandmother was a social worker for the Nazi party. They were, um, my family are from Hamburg. Um, my mother was born in 1934. So she was um, 11 when the war ended. And if, if anybody's read The Dark Room, my first novel, The Dark Room, the middle story in The Dark Room, Laura, which was made into a film as well, was very loosely based on my mother's experience. So my family were... Um, the British bombed Hamburg in 1943 and the, the created a firestorm which destroyed a lot of the city and my, my mother's family were on holiday at the time in south of uh, Hamburg but she saw it happening, she saw it on the horizon and uh, after that they were evacuated to Bavaria where my grandmother ran a mother and baby home for... Um, Women who's women who's who'd lost their homes in the firestorm, and my uh, at the end of the war, my grandfather was in Russian captivity, and the Americans invaded Bavaria and uh, arrested my grandmother. So my my mother, who was the eldest of four children, was left to go to Hamburg to return to Hamburg by herself. Um, and so I wrote, I wrote a story about that, <laughs> based on um, my mother's stories. And it was kind of, it's a kind of coming of age. It's a, it's a girl having to go across Hamburg, uh, not, uh, across Germany to Hamburg, so right from the south, Bavaria to the north, Hamburg, and to see what had happened to her country 
in the war years and also to realise what her countrymen had been doing um, during the period of the Third Reich. You know, so a Nazi child becoming denazified, as happened to my mother. Although for her it didn't happen over the course of you know, one journey. It was obviously, that's the kind of thing that can only happen in a book. <laughs> And do you think that background has sort of driven your compulsion and interest in, in this? I think it certainly makes... Um, I mean, history, you know, as a, as a British child... I, you know, I was born in 1971, so I, uh, the war wasn't that long ago. And... Um, but from... I mean, for my, my contemporaries growing up, maybe their grandfathers had been soldiers in the war... But um, it was, to a large extent, I think, much more about films and comic books and so on for them. Whereas uh, my mother always told me about my grandparents. So I I'd never had it hidden from me. Um, and I grew up knowing that about my grandparents and knowing very clearly that the, the Germans had been wrong, that the Germans were the enemy, um, because I grew up in Britain. And I think then history is not... History is something that's really in your core <laughs> if, you, if you grew up like that. It's not, um, it's not at all distant. It's very personal. One more question. Time for one more. Yes. Um, well, that's very, it's very different for different books. So I've written two books about the that are, um, you know, either set in the Third Reich or about the Holocaust in some way. Um, and the first one ranges over. So it's one of it's the three parts, and one is in Berlin during the 1930s um, and during the war. One is in the weeks and months immediately after the war. And one is in the 1990s, looking back um, on the occupation of Belarus and a grandfather's involvement in that. So there's very disparate time periods. Um, a lot of research. And then there is this new book, which was very contained, you know, in terms of in place and time. And, you know, so it's three days in the UK, in just in the U that, that occupied territory. And also sort of a very thin slice of Ukraine, as it were, because that's how far the Germans had got um, uh, and in their invasion. And I had read some of the stuff before because I'd been looking at Belarus. Um, and the, the area that my fictitious town I set it in is in that sort of more marshy borderlands between Ukraine and Belarus. So some of the stuff I had already read, it was kind, you know, it was there in my, in my memory, and um, I reread, and also in the intervening decade and a half, two decades, um, more had been written. Uh, so, but but it wasn't quite because it was much more contained, and I also had a grounding in it already. So the dark room took, my first novel took three years to write and research, and this book took 18 months. But then, you know, then I also wrote a book called The Walk Home, which was set in Glasgow, and centres around a family, a pro white working-class Protestant family, and, and, and to write them convincingly, although I'd worked in, lived and worked in Glasgow, my husband's Glaswegian, um, I had to read endlessly about the troubles and I had to write terrible boring scenes <laughs> in which my characters explained Cromwell <laughs> and Ireland to each other uh, you know so that's part of the 200,000 words that I had to discard and that book took seven years to write and research so it's a real it's it's how long is a piece of string and it really is you know if your question is how long should I be researching for Okay. 
But in case anybody has that question, um, that's an impossible question to answer. It, it's just, it's, it's as long as it takes for you to be able to write a scene that you're convinced by. Probably. Thank you so much to Rachel for a wonderful <laughs> reading. Before you depart, let me remind you of a few wonderful facts. Um, the first is that Rachel is very, very happy to sign books, and that there are books for sale by October Books, well, probably one of the few independent bookstores in the entire UK, let alone in Southampton. Um, so they are outside because there are so many wonderful people here tonight. And um, so that is um, possible for you, and I'm sure Rachel will be happy to talk to you as well. And um, to remind you that we have more Writers in Conversation coming up this autumn. Our very next one is in two weeks with Alex Weedle, a writer from London who is the Guardian Children's Book Award winner from last year. Um, that's also on Monday night at 7.30. On November 12th, on Sunday, in conjunction with the Human Worlds Festival, we have Jennifer Egan, um, the Pulitzer Prize winning author of a visit from the Goon Squad, which, and she's reading from her own new book, Manhattan Beach, also set in World War II um, in New York, just as the Americans have gotten involved in the war, and it's a marvelous book. Um, and I'll have, I'll have you know that the very next day she's in London, five pounds here, free if you're students, 16 pounds 50 at The Guardian. <laughs> so what a bargain. Um, and finally, we have our own Philip Hoare, um, the wonderful nonfiction writer, reading and talking from his book, Oh Dear, Rising Tide, Falling Star. And that is on Monday, back here at the um, Nuffield on December 4th. And Jennifer Egan, by the way, we're going to have the 200-seat Lecture Theater A and Avenue. So bring many, many of your friends to um, all right, so thank you again to Rachel, and thank you all for being here, and we'll see you hopefully in two weeks. Thanks. <laughs>